I'd like to welcome all of you to New Baptist Church as we begin our time of worship together. It's a beautiful month out and a lot of things are happening. I want to share a few announcements. Find my announcement sheet here. Um, this week, I, I lost my announcement sheet, so we'll have to go by memory here. This week, we have a number of things going on that are important. Um, this Wednesday is a business meeting. We do have our uh, regular Awana program, begins at 6 o'clock, and our youth program with that. And then at 6.30, it will be a regular business meeting. Um, it's an open business meeting. All are invited to attend, and um, it's just where we do that every bi-monthly. And then on Saturday of this coming week, we have our fall festival. It is from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock. We do need more candy. So if you have candy to bring, please bring it. Um, what we do in that fall festival, we arrange a truck or a type of trunk or treat, but in the context of Bible stories. We want people to walk through the entire Bible in terms of narrative stories so that scripture and thus the gospel is shared with people. And so um, we are looking for more people to bring candy, more people just to greet people. If you are a storyteller, Please come somewhere between 15 to 20 minutes before that to get set up and get ready. If you're working in the kitchen, please come roughly around 8.45 to 9 o'clock to help us get ready for that event as well. That's this Saturday. Also, you see in the back, we have some boxes stacked up there. That's Operation Christmas Child. We will be doing that. I guess Collection Sunday, I'm told, is November the 13th. We don't have the forms yet, but I believe that they will be coming soon. So just we'll share that again next week. With that, please stand with me as we begin this time of worship together. We like to memorize scripture through the year, and right now we are memorizing Psalm 23. Let's, um, let's recite it together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Let's pray. Gracious Father, may this morning our cups overflow. May you fill us with your spirit. May you fill us with yourself. May you fill us with the joy of fellowship. And may you warm our hearts towards you. We are grateful, Father, for this day. I ask your hand upon our worship. I ask your hand upon the time that we open up your word. And I ask your hand upon the time that we sing praises. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning. If you would remain standing as we begin to worship. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet I sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the 
before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. from 1 Peter. It's chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is God's word. His face I at last 
shall see it will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me and everybody singing how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall you pray with me? Gracious Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this time that we have to come into your presence. And Lord, we, we sometimes fail to remember of how gracious you are, how loving you are, how good you are, and in failing to remember these things, we, we lack the courage to actually come before you and ask for the things that we need the things that you, so you give us so freely. And in failing to ask, we are blind to when you do give and we fail to give thanks. So Father, this morning we come before you um, seeking your help. Your help to hear, your help to uh, respond, your help to be sensitive to your spirit, your help to be sensitive to what is happening within our own hearts and our own lives so that we may rightly pray to you. We are grateful that you provide for all that we need. We are grateful that you have provided to us the forgiveness of sins. We are grateful that you have called us to yourself. And as we pause at this time, we are mindful of people today who are hurting, who are in need of your presence, who are in need of your healing hand, who are in need of friendship and, 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 and kindness, Father. And so we pause and lift those people up to you now. Lord, we're mindful of some of the, the um, disasters that have hit our country recently in terms of, stor of storms and ask your hand of providence and protection upon those who are without homes. We pray the same likewise for those within our own community. We lift them up to you. And Father, we are also mindful to give you thanks for those who give to the ministries of this church. We pray your blessing upon both the gift and the giver. We ask that those gifts may be used wisely and rightly according to your purposes. And Father, once again, I ask your spirit to be upon us during this time. May we give our attention towards you, towards the work that you're doing in our world and within our own lives. And Father, as we near the time of dismissing our children to Kids Church, we pray for Kids Church today. We ask your hand of blessing upon that time, upon those who are instructing our children. May it be a time of, of um, you enriching them. We thank you, Father, and in Christ's name, amen. right on about the third try, so hang in there. Take me back to the day I met you when my dead heart came alive. 
child before the king. I'll shout like I've heard it for the first time. You have come to save the lost and last. You are the God who always takes me back. Thank you, Anna. Well, well, let's have our kids stand up. Let's clap our hands and, and let's go out to kids' church. you ever gone on a vacation, had an amazing time, saw some amazing things, and then you came home trying to share with others what you saw, and it just, you just couldn't do it? People just couldn't catch, couldn't see what you saw? Maybe a grand sunset that you want to tell people what you saw, just life-changing, and and you tr begin to share that with people, and they're just a little bit of a blank face. Uh, they don't quite get it. And I know that if you've ever been overseas or been in the military or done these big things, and you try to share that with people, people just don't seem 
to catch it. And that's kind of how I feel like being a preacher sometimes. And I don't mean to be dismissive. I mean to say that God's word's amazing. It is beautiful. It is awesome. It is brilliant. It is life-changing. And I, I come in the morning just, I honestly feel on some Sundays that this is going to be the best message I ever preach. And I feel that more than you realize, right? You know, this is the most important one I ever do. And after church on many Sundays, I'm let down that I did not do a good enough job, that it's not, that, 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 that I failed to describe the beauty of God's Word. And so when we come on Sunday mornings, we must come um, with the help of God's Spirit, because He's the one, the Spirit of God, that makes God's Word come alive to us. And so we need to take time to pause and simply ask God, we need your help to open up God's Word, to liven our hearts and our minds. And I do ask you to pray, pray for me as I share God's Word, but pray for yourself too, that the Spirit of God will be at work in you. So let's do that now together. Gracious Father, your Word is beautiful. And there's so many things we take for granted in this world that you have given to us that it seems we take for granted your, of your word of one of the things we do most often. May your spirit open our eyes. May we see beautiful and wonderful things in your word. May we not just be in awe of the brilliancy of the author of this, but know that it is inspired by you, that you have called it forth. You have breathed it into being, that it is the source of how we know you. So, Father, open our hearts and open our minds as we come to your word this morning. May it enliven us. May it change us. May it instruct us. May it challenge us. May it be the source of which we put our roots into and grow to be oaks and trees of faith and of righteousness. We thank you, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we have been in the book of Hebrews since Easter. And the book of Hebrews is a book of encouragement. The book answers the question, why? Why Jesus? Why believe? Why have faith? Why endure? Why persevere? And the answer is very simple. The answer that the author give is this. Because Jesus is greater and better. I'm going to be using that phrase a lot this morning. So when you hear that phrase, greater and better, think back to Jesus. Jesus is greater and better than the angels because he is the divine king, the radiance of the glory of God. Jesus is greater and better than Moses because Moses was just a servant of God. Well, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is greater and better than Joshua because Joshua, because Jesus brings a greater rest to the people of God than Joshua did. And Jesus is greater and better than Aaron as priest because he is sinless and immortal. And just as Jesus is greater and better in these things, so too does he build a greater and better covenant built upon a better sacrifice of himself. Therefore, Jesus is our great high priest because he's provided a living way into the very presence of God. And Jesus, by his blood, has provided for us the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. And if that doesn't grip you, I do not know what will. And because of who Jesus is and what he has done, we come to that wonderful application in Hebrews 10. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. 
Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Chapter 11, the chapter we are in now, is all about this holding fast and drawing near to God by faith. And last week, as we began chapter 11, we looked at the first six verses. And in those six verses, we looked at what faith does. What is the work of faith in your life? We looked at three things very briefly. It was outlined for them last week. Faith transforms a life into one that pleases God. Faith is the means that the grace of God is received. And faith is how one lives in the world based upon God's presence, on his work and his purposes. Last week, we focused in on that first point of faith transforming a life into one that pleases God. We looked at the examples of Abel and Enoch. Well, today we're moving down the next section of this book of Hebrews that we'll be focusing on faith as the means or is the means that the grace of God is received. And when I say the word grace, I'm talking about what God gives to us. I love Ephesians 2.8. It is such an important passage for by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own thing. It is a gift of God. So we have gifts that God gives to us. Those gifts are grace. That's what we are focusing on today, the gifts that God gives to us, the grace that we receive by faith. And in our scripture today, we are given three examples of three people who receive a gift from God. The first example that we meet is a man called Noah. And here is the scripture. Ephesians 11, verse 7. By faith... Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Wow, that rocks my world. I'll tell you why in just a moment. If you were here last week, you will remember that I gave a very brief definition of faith. What is faith? And Faith can be described as being three things all working together. Faith is knowledge. You have to be, believe in something. And so we see here in the context of this passage, Noah had a knowledge. He was warned with something from God. He knew something. And not only did he have that knowledge, but he accepted it to be true. Faith involves having knowledge and the acceptance of that knowledge. And then, based upon that acceptance, a living out of trust. And we see Noah living out his trust of what he accepted to be true by building an ark. And that ark, I love um, Hebrews 11 verse 1, is, you know, faith is the evidence of things unseen. The ark literally was the physical evidence of the faith of something yet unseen, right? So that's a great example of that verse right there. And so we see Noah by his faith, knowledge, acceptance and in that acceptance trust and then we read what he receives here is his gift right by faith noah became an heir of righteousness in case we missed it that comes by faith noah became an heir of righteousness think about that phrase for just a moment in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, we are told that Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And in 2 Peter 2, 5, we are told that Noah is a herald of righteousness, which simply means that Noah, by the very way he lived, proclaimed a right and godly way of life. The word righteousness is used to describe how Noah lived in comparison to the world around him. But here in this verse, in this phrase, when it says that he became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith, it communicates to us that there is a righteousness that's not Noah's, right? It's not, it's not his righteousness, but there's a righteousness that is external to him. 
It's foreign to him. It's alien to him. A righteousness that is outside of him that he only received, that is only his by faith. A righteousness that was far greater and far better than any righteousness of his own. Now we're going to come back to this righteousness in a moment. But before we do, let's look at the other examples of the gifts that God gives to us by faith. The second example is in the man called Abraham. And our passage begins at verse 8 now. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God so again in this um, example we see faith um, we see knowledge um, Abraham was called and there was a promise so and, and Abraham accepted that knowledge to be true he trusted in that promise, so he went to live as a foreigner in the land that God promised to him and, and his descendants. The evidence of his faith is clearly seen. But notice what Abraham received. By faith, we read that he, along with his sons of Isaac and Jacob, become heirs of not only to a promised land in this world, but of a city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. And I don't have it on the screen. If you jump down to verse 16, the author even says, I'm talking about heaven, people. If you don't get it, this is heaven. A better country that is a heavenly one. In other words, what Abraham received by faith was not just a promised land for his future descendants in the world, but he received a promised land for himself. A land, a country, a city that is far greater and better than any in this world. A city not made by human hands, thus full of sin, but, but by the hands of God, therefore a country that's pure and radiant and good. Abraham becomes a heir, a future recipient of a heavenly home we now come to the third example we'll return to that in a moment but let's look at the third example of faith what faith receives and we meet a woman named sarah the wife of abraham and we read of this example beginning at verse 11 by faith sarah herself received power that's what she received we see it right there to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised, therefore for one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Now, I hope you know the story of Sarah. It's a fairly well-known story. It takes place in the book of Genesis. God had promised to Abraham and Sarah that they shall have descendants, as we see in the passage, as numerous as the stars in heaven and, and as many as the grains of the sand by the seashore. But after many years, after that promise had been given, after many years, Sarah had yet to give birth. And there was a time when Abraham and Sarah thought that the promises of God are things that they have to deliver upon, that they have to do, and so there's a story about Hagar and Ishmael, a real debacle, and God just shakes his head and says, no, that's not what I mean. And um, the point of the whole story is that the promise of God is not what you do, it's what God does. And the reason why God, I believe, made Sarah wait till she was 90 years old before she had her first child was for there is no doubt at all whose power made this happen. It's God's power. God made it happen. It's his promises to fulfill. And so Sarah at 90 conceives, has, is by faith, has power, conceives, and has a child. And, 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 and we read on that also there is a sense that Sarah 
sees those future descendants of that child as well. She was given power to do something that she had no power to do, a power that comes from God alone. And that power at work in Sarah pointed to that future greater work that God had yet to do. So now we have three stories of faith. By faith, Noah became an heir of righteousness. That was his gift to him. By faith, Abraham became a heir of a heavenly home. That was his gift to him. And by faith, Sarah received power. Now, when I saw these three gifts there, my mind exploded. What is the grace of God? What, what are the gifts that he gives to us? What are the free things we have in Christ? And of course, if it was a brainstorming session and just opened it up, we could list all kinds of things that God gives to us. We, by faith, by his grace, we have the forgiveness of sins. We are born again into God's family. We are reconciled to God. We are sanctified. We are redeemed and delivered from the law of sin and death. We have eternal life. We are part of the body of Christ. We are a child of God. Our names are recorded in the book of life. We are part of the household of God. We are seated in the heavens with Christ. We receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has placed his, his fruit in us, love, joy, peace, and so forth. God's grace is full. God's grace is abundant. But if we are to summarize all of God's grace down to just three things, I think it would be these three. These are the things that God gives to us. A heavenly home, righteousness, and power. For it is in these three things that we witness God himself giving himself to us. Remember, the good news of the gospel is God. It's him giving himself to us. Now there are two things about the Christian faith that make the Christian faith different from all other religions in the world. Two things that make us unique. I know that there are some people who say that all religions are the same, they all pray, they all have a God, they all have things you're supposed to do. Well, that is absolutely false. There are two things that are unique about Christianity. And the first thing, I think one of the most, they're both very important, the first thing is our knowledge of God. The Christian faith understands and believes that our God is triune. He is Father, Son, and Spirit. That God's very nature is relational. He exists in himself in relationship. And it's because of the very nature of God that we can actually say God is love because Father, Son, and Spirit, they exist in relationship. And because of this uniqueness of our God he has created you to enjoy that fellowship and and because he's created you he has also redeemed us and called us into fellowship with himself the other thing that is absolutely unique about Christianity unlike Islam or Buddhism is that all other religions of the world they give to you a list of things you need to do to get something from God. The five pillars of Islam, the eight steps of Buddhism, and so on. That's all religions are religions of works. But when Jesus came, he told us something different. He said to us, I got good news and I got bad news. And I know I'm summarizing, that's not a scripture verse. The bad news is this. Your God is a righteous God. And the demands that you must do to satisfy his righteousness is far greater than anyone can do. You can't do it. You can't do it. But here's the good news. I can do it. Not only can I do it, I shall do it for you. And so when we talk about righteousness not even Noah was righteous enough to get to God. That's the bad news. But the good news is that Jesus is righteous enough. 
and he gives that righteousness to us. We call that giving a crediting of righteousness or a imputed righteousness. So when we talk about God giving himself to us, what does that look like in the context of who God is? I think our author of Hebrews, the Holy Spirit, is remarkable here. It, it, number one, it is about the Son giving himself to you, giving his righteousness, his own righteousness to you. Now, this is sometimes difficult for people to understand, and I recently came across an illustration of this crediting of righteousness um, the image is in scripture, but the author, the author is Barry Cooper. He's expressed it in a different way, um, using the same image. I want to use, do what he has, how, how he's explained it, I want to use his example. This is the example of this righteousness being imputed, being credited to us. Imagine one day you turn on the TV, and you see a news report about a royal family and your jaw drops. The prince in line, the prince to be king, has married a prostitute. And then you see her. She's been living on the streets. She's been overwhelmed with a mountain of unpaid debt. She's homeless. She's filthy. She's, uh, she, she's, she's literally nearly starving. Her lips are chapped, and she's an addict to drugs. She is totally a person who just uh, the worst of what you can imagine. And then the camera is cut from her over to the prince, and he says about her, I've always loved her. That he loved her from the very beginning, and nothing will separate them. And then the camera is cut away to the members of the public, and there's uproar and anger. They think it's disgraced for the entire royal family. And of course, they're right. Because for the prince to marry this woman, he's going to have to accept her shame and disgrace that's connected to her. He has to be willing to be associated with her and pay off her debts that she can't pay. And he has to pay a huge price. And not only that, of course, but now she gets to become associated with the royal family. Her legal status changes forever. Whatever else she may have been, she's now the future queen having been saved from the debt she was under she now finds herself enjoying the limitless wealth of her husband this is what imputed righteousness looks like as shocking as that marriage would be it's nothing compared to the shock of christ's marriage to his people we are like that drug addicted debt ridden prostitute We've given our hearts and bodies to a thousand other lovers. We have, in other words, treated the things that are not God as if they were God. We're filthy and addicted and widely in debt. And yet he comes to us and says, I want you to be my bride. I want us to become one flesh. And he, and he dresses us in perfectly white robes. He publicly stands with us before witnesses. He places a royal signet ring on our finger and places a crown upon our heads. Christ the King takes our hand and walks us down the aisle, having the righteousness of Christ credited to us is more than just our past sins being forgiven. It is the perfectly sinless life of Christ now being given to us, credited to us as if we ourselves have lived it. His righteousness is now our very own because we're united with him, become one with him. And the father looks at us as he looks at his own dear son with approval and tenderness and love. And just as it is impossible for the father to stop loving the son, so it is impossible for the father to stop loving us. His love is eternal and unshakable. And none of this would have been possible, of course, if not for the cross. We get the robe of righteousness because Jesus was stripped naked. We get the royal signet ring on their hand because nails were driven through his. We get a crown on our head because of the thorns that were on his. That's the good news of the gospel. We get the Son. We get his righteousness given to us. But we also get the Father. 
the Father is given to us. And the Father gives to us His presence. He gives to us the heavenly home. In John chapter 14, Jesus tells His disciples that His Father has a house, and it's amazing, and it's yours on TV, we often catch glimpses of these mega million dollar mansions with rooms and pools and giant kitchens and so on. But compared to the Father's house, these mega million dollar mansions are hovels. They're holes in the ground. I think just one room of the Father's house is greater and better than the largest mansion this world has ever seen. And Jesus says, my Father's house has many rooms, and I'm going to go there and prepare a place for you. You're moving in with my dad, the Father God Almighty, and you're not moving in as a visitor or as company, but as a child, as a member of the family, a son and daughter of God. It's your home forever. Not only does God the Son give to us his righteousness But God the Father gives to us his very dwelling place and his presence to be with us forever. The good news of the gospel is is God. We get God, we receive the righteousness of the Son, and in getting God we shall dwell eternally in the house of God the Father, and in getting God we are also given the Spirit of God who gives to us power. And the power of the Spirit of God gives birth. I like the image of Sarah. He gives birth in us to such things as love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and so on. These are the fruit of the Spirit. God power lives in us. And it's these things that we receive by faith. By faith. So, the application this morning. The first application is rather clear, right? Have faith. Believe upon Jesus Christ. Accept him. Trust him. For it is by faith that his righteousness becomes ours. It's by faith that, 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 that God's home becomes our home. And it's by faith that the Spirit of God fills us with power. Have faith. The second application, which I believe is a very important one that the author is trying to convey, is to persevere with what you're going through today. Trust God with what you're going through today. Did Noah see Jesus and his righteousness clearly in his day? Did Abraham see the heavenly home clear? Did Sarah see us, the church, as part of her descendants? I don't know how clear they saw these things, but I know they saw something. They saw God doing something. They knew that God was at work, and because of who they knew about God, they trusted him in what they were going through. We see this message in the last verses of our scripture today. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, a greater and better country, that is a heavenly one, Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. I don't know what they saw exactly from afar, but they saw something that caused them to not count this world as their home, and they set their eyes on a heavenly one, and it is the same for you and me. I, I know that we go through things that are hard, And I know that when we go through things that are hard, we rarely, if ever, know why. We ask, Lord, why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this to happen? Why why is this going on in my life? We don't have answers to those things. But, like Noah, 
and Abraham and Sarah, we do see through the promises of God the greater things that God is doing and has in store for those who love him. So let us be encouraged and seek that better country, for God has given himself to us. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Father, may we have eyes to see what you have given to us. And by seeing what you have given to us, may we rightly live in this world. May we rightly recognize your hand and your, your presence and your power. May we be the recipients knowingly of, of the things that you give every day. Father, we thank you for giving yourself to us and in giving yourself to us. And thank you that we have been given the righteousness of Christ that we have been given a heavenly home with you forever, and that we've been given your spirit poured out upon our lives now. We thank you, Father, in Christ's name, amen.
Let's all stand um, for the last song, but also thank you, choir. We need to do that more often. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was important. Let's sing together. Come thou fount of every blessing. Gracious Father, we thank you for this morning. I ask that you, as you have promised to do, give yourself to these people. Fill them with um, the power of your spirit. Give to them the righteousness of your son and remind them that they have a heavenly home with you that is secure, Father. Allow that hope to be granted to them, to secure them in whatever they're going through in these days. We thank you, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. 